mentioned and, and you've written about it, the scandal of the evangelical mind. And, and you were writing it in one, as you mentioned, there are turning points, but there are also cultural moments on why those books are necessary that may not always be needed outside of that time. And what, what I mean by that is you're addressing an issue that you saw. Um, and my question is, is, is that issue, I mean, we're 20 some years away from that book now. Is that issue as relevant as you would? Look, let me ask a couple of questions. Number one, why did you write the book? Number two, what was the cultural thing that you felt like you needed to address? And number three, has the cultural milieu shifted yeah. Yeah. where that book is still necessary? Yeah, I know those, those are excellent questions. And actually, those are more or less what I've, I've tried to address in the preface and the new preface and a new afterward to a reprinting that Erdman's did of the scandal of the evangelical mind. So the research for the original book was the late 80s or early 1990s. And, and um, it was at a time when um, debates among evangelicals and fundamentalists tended to be focused on, uh, on how you interpret the scriptures. So um, what, what should be the attitude of Christ honoring, God fearing, Bible reading people toward modern science. I, I used evolution as, as, a, as a prime example. Um, how, how should these same people be thinking about and acting in the uh, political landscape of, of, the, of the late 20th century? And the, the, the burden of the, that book was to say that there were some uh, really fine, uh, important qualities of fundamentalism that should be carried on, but there were some that should be dispensed with. And I've, I've focused on ways of reading the Bible that, that took the Bible out of its context and, and uh, kind of put it together like a late 19th century jigsaw puzzle. One, one of the examples was um, the, um, the, the first Iraq war, which led to a huge evangelical market for books on the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. So re reading uh, Re Revelation and Saddam Hussein was going to be so and so, and you, you know the. Uh, so, so those those habits of mind, I thought, were getting in the way of what, what would be proper Christian approach to life and study in the world. Not, of course, accepting everything that was conventional in in the in American intellectual life. But but approaching these matters with discrimination and and uh, with clarity. Now we, we, things have have changed. The threat to clear thinking about Christianity in relation to the culture, to the life of the mind, I think, comes from the politicization more we, we've been talking about. There, there, at least as I'm aware, and and broadly speaking, evangelical circles, there's not nearly so much debate today as to what biblical inerrancy means for. Your approaches to science, your, your your understanding of the Book of Genesis, the Book of Revelation, as there was then. Um, in, in my view, that's not a bad situation because uh, that earlier focus was much of what I was complaining about in, in writing the scandal of the evangelical mind. What hasn't changed is, is that there's a sense that the, uh, the 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 Christian faith implication for intellectual life. Need, needs to be developed from the inside the Christian faith itself. Uh, after writing the scandal of the evangelical mind, I worked what was supposed to be a year or two later on another book, Jesus Christ and the Life of the Mind. It took probably 15 or 20 years to finish. But the, the argument of that book was that, that when, when you're worried about, as a Christian, problems in science, uh, social sciences, literary theory, you, you have to be listening to what smart people are saying in the world, but it's even more important to be grounded in the truths of the Christian faith. What, what does it mean for God to become incarnate? What does it mean for hope for the world to come from the incarnate God being killed and provides from the dead? Um, so so the, the, the external circumstances have changed somewhat, but the internal dynamic of what the kind of Christian thinking the church always needs and the world always needs that that's, remains the same, and it's going deep into the Christian faith itself to have your parameters when you are faced with a uh, a secular intellectual world, which is all sorts of ideas. Um, the instinct is to say, "Well, I just know that this is a bad idea. I just know that's a good idea." 
And my appeal is, well, just avoid the instinct. Try to think through things. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. Sometimes the children of man are more uh, uh, alert than, than the people in the kingdom. What in modern literary theory from a Christian standpoint can be accepted? What needs to be rejected? What in uh, modern uh, understandings of science uh, should be expect should be respected? What? But it needs a thought process of of uh, considering these matters rather than an instinct and, and a reaction. So I think that situation is the same. And uh, uh, so I, I was actually uh, pleased that the editors at Erdman thought it'd be, it'd, it'd be in a different situation, worthwhile pu republishing the book, adding new introductory and concluding material, but, but uh, trying to say that the same kind of problem can arise in any circumstance where, where a Christian community is thinking about the world, not from a foundation of Christian faith, but simply reacting to what's out there in the broader public. 